thank you so much for joining me today where we're going to be talking about um, ACEs. The name of the session is Understanding ACEs and the Impact of Trauma. My name is Jody Spicer and I'm really excited to be here today with all of you. I am the ACEs consultant for the Michigan Department of Health and Human Services. And in that role, I work with state systems, uh, state colleagues and community partners to understand about adverse childhood experiences and how those connect to poor health outcomes uh, and how those kind of work in this um, community settings as well as in families. And so I'm really excited to be here today uh, to talk to you all about ACEs and the impact of trauma. So a little bit about me. Um, obviously, I'm here today as the ACEs consultant. Uh, I'm also a master trainer with the Michigan ACE Initiative, which I'll talk about in a little bit. But I'm also a mom. Uh, I am the proud mom of two boys. Uh, on the right is Cameron, he's in college. And on the left is Kai, he's in 11th grade. So I'm also a mom. I'm also a daughter and a sister. Um, I'm also that little girl there in the long pink dress holding my cousin Jessica. Um, and the reason I like to share that is just to help us all remember that we wear lots of hats and we actually have lots of stories and strengths and uh, lots that we bring to our day-to-day -day work. And so one of the things I'd like us to do as we get started today is to consider the parable of the blind man and the elephant. The parable goes like this. A group of blind men encounter an elephant for the first time. Each of them touch different parts of the elephant. Not knowing what an elephant is like, each of them comes to a different conclusion based on his own experience. One blind man touches the elephant's side and claims that the elephant is like a wall. Another blind man touches its leg and exclaims that the elephant's like a tree. Another blind man touches the tusk, the trunk, the ear, and the tail and believe that the elephant is like a spear, a snake, a fan, and a rope. They argue over what the elephant is like based on their experience. In some versions of the story, the argument is never resolved. In different versions, the number of men vary. At the end of the story, a sighted man explains to the blind men what the elephant really is like and resolves the argument. So what's the moral of the story here and why am I sharing it with you? Each blind man touches only a part of the elephant and believes it's the entire story. They base their opinion on how an elephant is on their knowledge of the animal, which wasn't complete. This is to say that people believe something to be true based on their own personal experiences and seldom go on to see the complete picture before coming to a conclusion. So my ask of you all today as we enter into this discussion about ACEs and trauma is to consider your perspective your personal experiences, your professional experiences, the experiences of those that you work with, both colleagues and students, children and families. Consider all of those as we explore and unpack the idea of ACEs and trauma and recognize that maybe what your experience or what your perspective is, isn't the whole picture. Just like I remember that I'm not just a mom or just an ACEs consultant, but also a daughter and a partner and a sister and a friend. So to get started, I'd like to just help people understand that really this process of learning about ACEs and understanding about trauma is a journey. And it's not linear, it doesn't go in a straight line, it's certainly not fast or easy. Uh, and there are phases and steps along the way. So today, this, is, this comes from the Missouri model, um, which uh, you'll have access to uh, in the digital folder. Uh, and really, where we're gonna be spending our time today is at the first part of this journey. Now, you may be a little further along in the journey, but where I like to start, my goal for today is really to 
create some shared meaning and some common understanding about the impact of trauma on children and adults with a specific focus on ACEs. So in phase one and phase two, the primary goals are to uh, create awareness and to help shape attitudes and to create some foundational knowledge and begin to create some skills. And so today, really, that's where we're at. As you continue on in this journey or as you continue to learn more, either individually or within your organization or your community, of course, you'll continue along on this journey. But just remember that uh, it isn't something that you can just check a box for or that you get a certification for, but really something that is invested in, um, both uh, personally as well as uh, professionally. So let's dive in and break it down. What are ACEs and how do they relate to trauma and toxic stress? This graphic actually comes from a larger infographic created by the Center on the Developing Child, which is an amazing resource. The, the infographic uh, is available to you all in the digital folder for the conference. And the reason I like it is because it does a nice job of giving an overview of what ACEs are. So ACEs stands for Adverse Childhood Experiences. And an adverse childhood experience is defined in the literature as a traumatic event that happens during childhood, which is defined in the research as under the age of 18. The ACE study identified 10 unique types of trauma, each of which counts as one point in an individual's ACE score. So the reason I share um, the definition of childhood uh, in part is because I have a 20 year old. And so in, in the research, he would be considered an adult. And I certainly think he has quite a bit more growing to do uh, and more learning and understanding to do. But the research itself was done as a retrospective study. So folks who were answering these questions were adults, which means they were over the age of 18, and they were asked to think about what happened in their childhood. And so that was defined as under the age of 18. So what are the 10 types of trauma that were identified? This is another infographic that I love. It comes from the Robert Wood Johnson Foundation, and again, is available to you in the digital library. But there are three buckets uh, or three categories of ACEs that were identified, and those are abuse, neglect, and household dysfunction. Under abuse, there is physical abuse, emotional abuse, and sexual abuse. Under neglect, there is physical neglect and emotional neglect. And then there's a third category known as household dysfunction, which really kind of captures uh, sort of a larger uh, group of experiences, which include living in a household with someone who has mental illness, living in a household where there's an incarcerated relative or substance abuse, living in a household where your mother has been treated violently and or living in a household where there is parental separation or divorce. The original study did look at mothers being treated violently, but further studies and certainly studies that have been done today look more at intimate partner violence, so violence between adults in the home. And the divorce ACE is an interesting one. In some literature, the ACE is actually um, defined as separation from an adult, and some people um, assume that could also mean death of a parent. And so I just like to point out to folks that the actual ACE that was studied and has come out of that research was uh, divorce and parental separation. So the kinds of questions that were asked were around that kind of experience. So, you know, did you live in a household where your parents argued with one another or there was inconsistent caregiving or you lived with only one parent some of the time or you moved back and forth between parents? Um, and so you can imagine that the experience of a child in a household like that is different than the experience of a child who is in a household where a parent died. Now, of course, death of a parent is a traumatic experience and may actually be an adverse experience in childhood, but it is not one of the 10 that was identified in this research. I'll talk about that a little bit more in a moment. 
So the study itself is unique because it provides the potential to understand how multiple forms of childhood trauma or stressors can affect all kinds of problems. So the design of the study actually began in 1991. In 1994, the CDC provided funding to conduct the study. And from 95 to 97, the study was actually conducted. It was a partnership between the Centers for Disease Control and Kaiser Permanente. So on the right, you'll see uh, Rob Anda. He's an epidemiologist, was an epidemiologist with the CDC. And on the left is Dr. Vince Folletti, who is a physician and uh, obesity researcher with Kaiser Permanente. The story that I was told when learning about the ACE study is that they were each doing their own research in their own respective kinds of worlds and fields. So Dr. Anda was looking at things like smoking and depression rates and really interested in the connection between the two. And as an epidemiologist was doing large surveillance studies. On the other hand, Dr. Folletti was working uh, in an obesity clinic as an obesity researcher. And as he tells the story, what he found was that their clinic itself was very successful. Um, this was in the early 90s. They had developed a program where people were able to enroll in the program who were morbidly obese and within months, if not um, a year, were able to lose dramatic amounts of weight. And so he, as he tells it, was feeling like they've really figured out this issue around obesity and had a very successful clinic. However, he began to notice uh, over time that there was a small segment of the um, participants who dropped out in, in ways that didn't make sense. So sort of just stopped attending or stopped being a part of the program. And Dr. Folletti said he was really intrigued and wondering about that and, and in some ways trying to figure out what was going on. So he did some, he and some of his colleagues uh, reached out to some of those patients and did some interviews to try to kind of find out what was going on. And one of the things he tells anecdotally is that he was interviewing uh, someone who was in his obesity clinic who had entered morbidly obese, lost a lot of weight, uh, and then dropped out of the program. And then after about six months, when he um, got in touch with her and actually interviewed her, he found that she had gained all the weight back and even more which he says he didn't realize was physiologically possible. So in interviewing her, one of the things he asked was, was asking all kinds of questions. And one of the things he asked was um, when this woman, when this person became sexually active and she indicated that she was eight, which took him by surprise. Obviously that indicates that she was sexually abused and he was really surprised by that. And so he began to um, ask further questions about her experience with the obesity clinic. And one of the things she said is that when she lost all the weight and went back to work and was out in you know, her community and, and with family and friends, she began to get attention um, and compliments and uh, praise for the hard work she had done in losing all the weight. And specifically, a man at her work actually uh, propositioned her, and it made her really uncomfortable. And in her interview with Dr. Folletti, she said that it took her back to when she was sexually abused by her grandfather. And one of her coping strategies at that time was to make herself, in her words, invisible or not um, attractive. And so she began to... Uh, overeat and move less again. And that is in, in essence how she gained all of the weight back. When Dr. Folletti tells that story, he said it was sort of like a light bulb moment for him because he realized that what he thought was the real problem, which was potentially um, calorie intake or physical inactivity, was maybe more of a um, an indication or more of a sign of something else. And really the, the true problem, at least in this woman's case, was uh, being sexually abused. So he and his colleagues began interviewing other participants who also dropped out. And the one thing he found in common among all of them 
was that they all had been sexually abused as children. And so he was very, very intrigued, very concerned, and, and very much interested in kind of trying to uncover and, and figure that out a little bit. One of the things he says about it that I will never forget is he said it sort of was um, like when there's a fire, one of the first things you see when there's a fire is the smoke. And if all you did was concern yourself with the smoke, you might bring in, let's say, fans to get rid of the smoke. Um, and really what that would do is fan the flames, which makes the fire even bigger. And so he said, you know, it really helped him understand that he had to do more than just look at the typical obesity indicators and really look at what else was going on. So fast forward, um, both Dr. Anda and Dr. Folletti were at a national conference and they met one another and actually began to realize that they had similar interests. Um, they were looking at sort of these underlying issues that may, or underlying um, activities or underlying um, behaviors that may have a connection to uh, negative health outcomes. As it turns out, Dr. Anda is an epidemiologist, um, so he does large surveillance studies for a living in that role. And Dr. Folletti was part of uh, the Kaiser Permanente Health System, which meant that he had access to people. And so they sort of kind of hatched this idea. And as I said, it took several years to actually bring it to fruition. But between 95 and 97, they actually conducted a study of 17,000 people in the Kaiser health system. And those 17,000 people, um, actually 26,000 people were asked the, over the course of a year, uh, would you be willing to answer some additional questions about your childhood? Everyone who's a part of the Kaiser health system um, receives a physical exam every year and also um, answers a health questionnaire. So during 95 to 97, this group of people were asked, would you be willing to answer some additional questions about your childhood? And 17,000 of the 26,000 agreed. So it's the largest surveillance study of its kind, which is really awesome and one of the things that makes it unique. So the important thing to note about that, and the reason I share the study um, in this way, is so that you realize, in, in essence, um, some of the potential limitations as well. So all of the participants were members of the Kaiser Health Plan, which in essence means they were all employed or related to someone who was employed. And the other thing to note about the study is that it was retrospective. So as I mentioned earlier, adults reported on things that they experienced in their childhood. The study itself actually uncovered uh, after they began analyzing the data that came in, uncovered the profound connection between early adversity, experiences of abuse, neglect, and household dysfunction, and adults' physical, emotional, and social health outcomes. So what they uncovered is that what happens to you in childhood actually has a direct connection to what can happen to you in adulthood. So who participated in this study? As I mentioned, um, there were 26,000 people who were asked if they would like to help learn more about childhood events, and 71% of those agreed to participate, so about 17,000. The participants, uh, as you can see from the graphic here on the screen, um, are a nice mix of male and female. They were predominantly white, so 75% of the participants were white. They were predominantly educated, so there were 39% that had um, a college degree or more. And they were predominantly middle class and the average age was about 57. So this demographic information is on the original study participants and more of that can be found on the CDC website, which I'll include in the digital folder. So it's just important to note that this isn't a, um, a sample that is highly diverse, right? So it's mostly, when I talk about it, I tell folks it was a nice mix of male and females, but it was predominantly white, middle class and middle age group of people. When Dr. Folletti and Dr. Anda talk about the study, one of the things they say is they weren't sure what they were gonna find because this group of people wasn't the typical at-risk audience that might 
produce negative outcomes, right? So this doesn't represent low income folks or those who have racial disparities or limited access to uh, resources. This is, you know, a group of people that you might expect would be okay, right? And so they weren't really sure what they were gonna find. So what I'd like to do in the next few minutes is kind of talk to you about what the ACE study actually did find. There are basically four take home messages that I'd like you to kind of take away from the presentation today. The first one, um, and this is the one that both Folletti and Anda say was the most surprising to them, is that ACEs are common but largely unrecognized. What that means is almost two thirds of adults surveyed, so two thirds of those 17,000 people, reported having at least one of those adverse childhood experiences. You can see here that the data that I'm sharing, the footnote is from the original study, which was published in 1998. So 36% experienced zero ACEs, but you can see that 64% or about two thirds had at least one ACE. 16% had two ACEs, about 10% had three, and 12.5% had four or more ACEs. So the take home message here, and the one that surprised the researchers is that this was really kind of a common occurrence that they really were not expecting. And the part about it being largely unrecognized is that these aren't the kinds of things we talk about. So when in a primary care setting or when um, working with other uh, professionals or within your community, it isn't the kind of thing you necessarily talk about. So while it was common, it wasn't widely known or understood. So here you can sort of see um, this slide shows the 10 categories of ACEs that were studied. And that first group of indicators is that larger um, category known as household dysfunction. So you can see that the highest uh, indicator within household dysfunction was substance abuse. 27% of those um, reported living in a household with substance abuse, followed by parental separation or divorce, then mental illness, then battered mothers, and then um, living in a household with incarcerated relatives or criminal behavior. Three forms of child abuse were studied, emotional, physical, and sexual, and two forms of neglect were studied, emotional and physical. As you can see from the percentages on the slide, ACEs are common in this middle-class, well-educated population. Because adverse childhood experiences are so highly interrelated, it didn't really make sense to look at how single categories of ACEs influenced health and social problems. So instead, Drs. Anda and Folletti developed what they call an ACE score. The score is simply a count of the number of categories of ACEs that each person reported from zero to 10. So each category counts as one point in a person's ACE score. So if a person experienced physical abuse, for instance, no matter how many times or what the severity of that abuse, the ACE score is one. If the person also experienced substance abuse or substance abusing parent, the ACE score is two and so on. So what I like to say to folks is think of the ACE score as sort of a measure of a child's stress dose. As the ACE score goes up, on average, the exposure to the developmental effects of trauma also increases. So again, you can see here that there's a large group of people that have zero ACEs, but we have two thirds of the population that have one or more. And so um, I just think it's important to acknowledge that um, an ACE score really just indicates if a person experienced that event. Now, of course, the severity of the event is going to have a um, effect on the outcome. So someone who is severely abused or neglected over many, many years is going to have uh, worse outcomes than somebody who was abused maybe um, once or twice or um, in less um, severe ways. But what this research found is that just having that experience is what determined the outcome. So that's why they were looking at this interrelation of these adverse experiences and why they created this ACE score. The second thing that the study found, so the second take home message is that ACEs rarely occur in isolation. They're highly interrelated and they tend to occur in clusters. What that means is if any one ACE is present, 
there's an 87% chance of at least one other ace present and a 50% chance of another or third ace. So think about that for a minute. It's really not that hard to maybe imagine what that might look like, right? So um, earlier in my career, I did, I worked in the home visiting world, did a lot of home visits um, with families who ha had experienced child abuse and neglect. And I can tell you that it was not uncommon that more than one of these things would um, present themselves. So maybe I was working with this family because they had a substantiated physical abuse um, case. But in working with the family, I also uncovered the fact that there was substance abuse in the home or that there was mental illness in the home or that there was also some neglect happening. And so you can sort of see how when you think about a person's experience or you think about um, children and the lives that we, that we lead, that many times these things, as we shared here, tend to occur co-occur, right? So it's rare that you're going to only see one of these categories. It doesn't mean that it doesn't happen because the data showed us that it does, but it's more common that we have two aces or three aces or more. The third thing that the study found, the third take-home message, so the first message, as you may remember, is that aces are common and hard, largely unrecognized. The second one is that they are highly interrelated and tend to cluster. This third take home message is that what they found is that ACEs have what's known as a dose response effect. Basically what that means is the higher the number of ACEs, the higher the likelihood of having a negative health or wellness outcome. So you can see on this graph that even if you have zero ACEs, of course, there's still a risk for negative health outcomes because ACEs aren't the only thing at play. There are lots of other things that determine our health outcomes. But as the number of ACEs goes up in our population or in this original study, the risk for these negative health outcomes also goes up in a stepwise fashion. That's what's known as a dose response. So what I'd like to share with you now is just a couple of data graphs that kind of show how this plays out. So this is from the original study you can see in the footnote that was published in 1998. And it's looking at a set of chronic disease indicators. So let me just orient you to the slide. So the red bar on the far left represents an ACE score of zero. And then on the far right of each of these, the light green bar represents an ACE score of four or more. And so we're looking at things like heart disease and stroke, cardiovascular disease, diabetes, and sexually transmitted disease. And what you can see here is that in every case, there is a marked difference between those that have zero ACEs and those that have four or more. In every instance, those adults who have four or more have a higher likelihood or a higher prevalence of that negative health outcome. So I often get asked, and actually I asked when I first saw this data, if you look at stroke, for instance, or even diabetes, you see that it kind of dips around two ACEs. And so I had the opportunity to actually um, train with Dr. Anda. And so I asked him, why is it that um, when someone reports two ACEs, that there is less of a chance of the negative outcome. And his response was pretty profound. He said, I don't know. <laughs> and so I think that is important to recognize that this is a population level study. So it's looking at a large group of people and comparing their ACE score with a negative health outcome. And so we can't really drill down to individuals when looking at this data. So it's really more looking at the trend. And the important thing to note here, for the most part, is it does go up in that stepwise fashion. And in every case, three or four ACEs represents a higher percentage of the population with that chronic disease than zero or one. The other thing to note here, of course, just like in the last slide, is even if you have zero ACEs, 
there is still the likelihood of having this chronic disease. And again, that's because there are other issues at play, not just ACEs. This next slide actually now compares an ACE score to mental health outcomes. Because one of the things we know, of course, is that the body is one, right? So we can't distinguish between, our body doesn't distinguish between physical health and mental health. It's really kind of all one. And you can see here, looking at the same um, data points with the red bar being zero, a, zero, a score of zero for your A score, and the light green bar being an A score of four or more, you can see here that the stepwise increase is even more dramatic. And in every case, sort of exponentially goes up. So here we're looking at mood disorders, anxiety disorders, substance abuse disorders, and impulse control disorders. You can see in looking at this footnote that this was a study that was done in 2013 uh, because the original study only looked at physical health outcomes. And so this follow-up study has begun to look at mental health outcomes. And what we're learning is that the mental health outcomes are even more dramatically affected by early adversity. Which again, if you take a moment and kind of step back and think about it, begins to make a little bit of sense. So this is probably the most sobering slide of the entire presentation. Um, and I think it's just important to note that what the original study found is that people who reported having six or more ACEs lived for an average of 60 years while those who reported fewer ACEs lived on average to be 80 years. So what that means is that folks who had six or more ACEs were more likely to die 20 years earlier on average than those with zero ACEs. Dr. Anda says, they tend to take on the risk factors that lead to poor health. They smoke more, they're more likely to use alcohol or illicit drugs or to be overweight or physically inactive. He also said they're twice as likely to die by 60 than people who had none of those adverse experiences. So it is a pretty sobering slide and I'll kind of unpack that a little bit in a moment. I think it's just important to acknowledge that these negative health outcomes are pretty serious that happen to folks with um, multiple ACEs. The good news is that many states are actually collecting ACEs data. So that original data was published in 1998 and many states beginning in about 2009 have begun collecting um, ACEs data through the behavioral risk factor surveillance system. And in Michigan, um, you'll see here that we actually added the ACE questions to the BRFS or the Behavioral Risk Factor Surveillance Survey. We added que the ACE questions in 2013 and in 2016. So I think it's important to note just briefly that the Behavioral Risk Factor Surveillance Survey is the way that states um, get data around their population. So all states do it, um, and here in Michigan, we do it every year, uh, and it's a telephone survey to both um, landlines and cell phones. And there's, um, uh, I think, around 12 or 13,000 people that actually take the survey, and they're not, it's not a convenient sample, it's a weighted sample. So they're determined to, the, the people that are asked these questions reflect the demographics of the state. And so the BRFS asks all kinds of questions um, around all kinds of health issues and health outcomes. And each state is allowed to add 25 state added questions. So in 2013 and in 2016, Michigan added the ACE questions to our BRFS. We actually did it again in 2019 and we're waiting for that data. But what I'd like to do is share with you what we learned about Michigan adults. And this comes from the 2016 data that we have. So the data I just shared with you was from the original survey that was done in the 90s and follow-up uh, research that was done. And then what I'd like to share with you now is specific to Michigan and Michigan adults. So to put this in perspective, 
um, I'm sharing here sort of a, a visual image. So let's think about the seating capacity of the University of Michigan's football stadium. Of course, many of us know that as the big house. It seats over 107,000 people. In 2016, over 1.1 million Michiganders reported being sexually abused one or more times as a child. What that means is that that's enough to fill um, 11 U of M football stadiums. That's a lot of people. And it's pretty sobering. That same year in 2016, we found that 2.74 million people were verbally abused one or more times as a child. That's enough to fill nearly 26 University of Michigan football stadiums. This slide actually shows the prevalence of each ACE that was found in our 2016 behavioral risk factor um, survey. And I like to share it just to kind of show that actually all of the ACEs were identified. Um, you can see that the highest number was verbal abuse. 39% of adults reported being verbally abused. 29% or 2.1 million reported living in a household with substance abuse. 27% reported living in a household with separated or divorced parents. 20% reported mental illness in their household. 19% reported living in a household where adults were physically violent to one another. If you recall, I said that the original study looked at mothers being treated violently, but here in Michigan, in our survey, we looked at um, adults being physically violent with one another or intimate partner violence. 18% reported being physically abused, 16% reported being sexually abused, and 9% reported living in a household with an incarcerated household member. If you're astute, you'll notice that there's only eight ACEs listed here and not 10. And I just wanna kind of give a little bit of a disclaimer and say that the two ACEs that are not represented here are the two neglect ACEs, so emotional and physical neglect. And the reason for that is that there would be far too many questions to ask that would get at that ACE. So we would have to ask, I think I was told 10 to 12 questions to determine if somebody was actually emotionally neglected or physically neglected. It isn't a straightforward question, like have you ever been emotionally neglected? There are some questions that get at that ACE and there are just far too many to include in uh, the Michigan surveillance study. That's really common when looking at ACEs research across the United States. It is more rare that states include the neglect. So whenever you see data around ACEs in states, it's most times out of eight ACEs and not 10. However, um, it, the message is still the same, the story is still the same, and actually could be worse, right? Because neglect is even worse in some cases, um, or just as devastating in some cases. So we can assume that these numbers would even be more dramatic. I like this slide because it actually shows the percent of Michigan by ACE score. So you'll see here that 34% reported having zero ACEs, 23% reported having one, 25% reported having two or three, and 4% re reported having, um, or 18% reported having four or more. So what does that mean? This is, the, this is the slide that gets me every time. What that means actually is that ACEs remain common here in Michigan in 2016 and maybe even today in 2020. So the blue pie chart that you see here on the left is the Michigan data. So 34% reported zero ACEs and 66% reported having at least one ACE. Compare that to the original study and it's really not that different. Only marginally, very small percentages make it different. And so to me, that means that we still have to figure this out, that this is something that remains common 20 years later, even on the other side of the country. Um, maybe I didn't say this early, earlier, the Kaiser Health System is in um, Southern California.
So here we are on the other side of the country, uh, 20 years later, and the uh, statistics, the data is relatively the same. So what that means then, and why we should care, right? So now that we've kind of unpacked a little bit about the study and the research and what, and we've begun to look at the data, both from the original study, as well as here in Michigan, the importance around this, why we should care and why this matters is that these early adversity or this ACEs, this ACE score has been shown to have lasting effects on all kinds of negative outcomes. So health outcomes, as I shared in previous slides, like obesity, diabetes, depression, STD, uh, cancer, stroke, even injury, things like broken bones. Uh, it also has a negative lasting effect on a person's behaviors. So the risk behaviors they engage in, like smoking or alcohol use or illicit drug use. And there's actually data that shows uh, that their are ACEs are connected to outcomes around life potential. So graduation rates and academic achievement and even lost time from work have a correlation with an ACE score. The reason for this, or one of the things to consider when thinking about this, and this is the fourth take home message, is that ACEs have a cumulative effect. So the higher the score, the higher the likelihood of health risk behaviors and poor health outcomes. And this is most likely due to the increased wear and tear on a person's body, which grows over time when an individual is exposed to or has repeated chronic stress. That's also known in the literature as allostatic load. So I think of it as literally carrying a load around. If I had to carry this load, this biological stress load every day from the time I'm a small child or an infant to adulthood, that is going to wear and tear on my body. And that's gonna grow over time as I continue to be exposed to these stressors. And that's in part why there's a higher likelihood of these health risk behaviors and poor health outcomes. This is probably, maybe I already said this, so I have a couple of favorites, but this is probably my favorite slide in the presentation. And I like it because it does a really nice job of explaining how ACEs sort of happen in a person's life. Um, and it's known as the ACE pyramid. At the time of the ACE studies design, almost all of the preventative research was about the top three rungs of this pyramid. And even today, most research literature is still about the top three rungs. So we identify risk and our purpose in identifying risk is so that we can reduce that risk and therefore eventually reduce disease, disability, and social problems. But what doctors Anda and Filetti kind of figured out is that something must be missing because they could see that these health risks were not necessarily random. They were concentrated in some populations. And people who have one risk tend to have others. So as I shared earlier, they tend to cluster. So they, that's why they decided to test their hypothesis and created this ACE score. And their hypothesis was that multiple forms of adversity could be a major determinant of health. So this is a whole life perspective. So looking at a person's life from conception or preconception to death. So I say before you were even the twinkle in your mom's eye to the time you die. And what this helps us understand is that the original ACE pyramid, actually, the bottom rung was ACEs. And what research has begun to understand is, as I've mentioned, there's more than just ACEs at play here. And so you'll see here that the bottom rung, um, which was developed in 2017, represents something that happens to large groups of people. It's noted here as historical trauma and interge intergenerational adversity. And the difference between that and ACEs is, is that this affects large groups of people. And so folks who have experienced racism or classism or sexism, those folks who have lived in communities with less access. Um, I used to talk about um, in Michigan, for instance, thinking about Flint as a community and the water crisis, that children growing up in Flint 
have different experiences than children growing up in, let's say, Grand Rapids, Kent County. And so that would represent um, some historical trauma or adversity that's unique to that community. Of course, we're currently living in um, a pandemic, which is a collective trauma that we're all experiencing. And so again, that is affecting large groups of people. And so it's important to note that there are things that are bigger than ACEs that will determine outcomes. So one of the ways I like to talk about it is it's sort of the places and spaces that we live, grow, play, work, and worship. And so, you know, where I grew up and where I live does affect my access to resources and or my ability to act, uh, to get help as I need it. And so that, that piece of it, that piece of the uh, ACE pyramid is an important thing to acknowledge that there are groups of people who experience historical trauma or have that um, repeated cycle of adversity that happens across generations. And that's an important consideration and determinant of health. At the same time then, there are children and adults who experienced adversity in childhood. So there are folks who have an ACE score. So I always say to folks, everyone in this session, everyone in this room or in this uh, presentation has an ACE score of zero to 10. And so thinking about what a person's ACE score is would kind of determine how wide the base of this pyramid is. What we know and what I'll be unpacking a little bit further for you is that when children experience these adversities, early in life, you'll see in that whole life perspective that it's earlier in life, there are neurodevelopment and epigenetic influences that happen. So that's just a fancy way of saying that our brains develop differently when exposed to trauma and our genes get expressed differently when exposed to trauma. Because, and especially in early childhood. And because of that then, we, our bodies, socially, emotionally, and cognitively function differently. So if I have um, a highly stressed uh, brain who's experienced lots of stress and lots of adversity, then I'm gonna approach the world very differently. I'm gonna approach the world differently socially, emotionally, and cognitively. I'm gonna learn differently. I'm gonna interact with people differently. I'm gonna approach the world and the way I interact with the world differently. Then of course what happens is we as people begin to adapt our behaviors to fit our needs. So if I am somebody who has a highly stressed brain because of early adversity or repeated adversity and I socially and emotionally function differently, I may find that there are some behaviors that help temper that. So maybe I learn that um, drinking alcohol or smoking marijuana sort of help temper that for me, right? Help kind of even things out for me. And so that adaptation, which really is a risky behavior, then um, begins to be repeated. And of course, what we know about those risky behaviors is that they lead to disease, disability, and social problems. And ultimately, those things lead to earlier death. So the reason I like the ACE pyramid is because I think it helps sort of explain how these things can happen. The takeaway around this slide is that it's important for us to think about these health risk behaviors as adaptations rather than maladaptations. So think back to that story I shared with Dr. Folletti. He began to understand that, let's say calorie intake or physical inactivity was really an adaptation for that woman, the, the anecdotal story that I shared. It was something she did to protect herself. So that was an adaptation, an adaptive behavior, which of course led to uh, her obesity. And so one of the things this pyramid does is it helps us shift our thinking from what's wrong with you? Why do you continue to do what you're doing? So I work in chronic disease and we have a lot of programs around smoking cessation or cardiovascular health 
Um, and so, you know, you might think, why do you keep doing these things? We, we're telling you why they're bad for you. Why do you keep doing that? What's wrong with you? Shifting your thinking from what's wrong with you to what happened to you. What's going on? What else can I learn about you that might help explain what's going on? And that's actually what the ACE study has allowed us to do, which I think is really powerful. The other thing I wanna note about the ACE pyramid is that of course trauma can happen at any time in a person's life. So um, trauma could happen anywhere along that um, continuum uh, from preconception to death. So, you know, I may experience trauma today, this month, this week, um, any of us may experience trauma in early adulthood, later adulthood, and those have negative effects. But when we experience those adversities early in life is when those neurodevelopment and epigenetic influences are the greatest. So we have the most opportunity for damage, in other words, to our brain development and our gene expression when those things happen early. I really like this graphic from the Center on the Developing Child because it does a nice job of sort of helping us understand a little bit about stress or adversity. So earlier I said if I had a really stressed brain. Um, I think it's really important for us to know that stress is actually uh, can be a good thing. And so this graphic actually kind of shows that continuum. There are things known as positive stress. So those are things like mild or short-lived stressors that are necessary for us to be able to function in this world. So thinking about my son started school yesterday, so thinking about the first day of school or thinking about my preparing for this presentation, that's, you know, sort of short stressful events. And the reason these are healthy for brain development is they help us prepare for stressful situations later in life. Then there's something known as tolerable stress, and those are more severe stress responses, but they tend to be shorter in duration and allow time for recovery. And then of course, on the far right is what we're talking about when we're talking about ACEs, and that is known as toxic stress. So that's extreme, frequent, or extended exposure to stress without that buffering presence of a supportive adult. So this is ongoing repeated exposure to abuse or neglect, and that's what's bad for brain development. So this is what affects the stress response, the stress hormones, and ultimately is why there is an increased vulnerability to lifelong problems. Looking at the brain, um, and I'm not a brain researcher, but I'm really intrigued by um, brain science. Looking at the brain, what happens when we are exposed to chronic stress or, or toxic stress is that leads to an overactive alarm system, basically. So that survival brain, the, um, pre, the limbic system, the lower brain functions take over and we live in that space. And the prefrontal cortex, which is the learning, thinking, rational part of our brain, really kind of goes offline. It, it sort of turns off. So think about if um, right now in the middle of whatever you're doing while listening to this presentation, let's say um, a smoke detector or a fire alarm went off, your limbic system would take over for a moment and your fight, flight, or freeze response would take over and you would know, most likely would know what to do. And then your learning and thinking brain would kick back in and help you manage um, how to move through that. What happens when children have this um, repeated exposure to trauma and toxic stress is that uh, limbic system actually becomes the default and that prefrontal cortex, the learning and thinking part of the brain, actually turns off more often. And so the prefrontal cortex is oftentimes literally smaller and less activated than the um, limbic system, which is where that fight, flight, or freeze um, comes from. So the amygdala, which is in the limbic system, is sort of the switchboard of our brain. So it sends information from our environment to the limbic system. So the amygdala is that, I think of it as the switchboard, right? So information comes in, like that fire alarm, and our limbic system, um, passes through the amygdala, which helps us understand what to do with that information. 
it helps us decide if it, an event or a situation is safe or dangerous. And the amygdala, when it's chronically stressed, actually has a hard time figuring out what real danger is and what false danger is. And the reason I share this is because I've actually experienced this um, when working with kids and families, where because of this overactive limbic system and an amygdala that is um, hypersensitive and the thinking part of your brain being less active, it's everything feels dangerous. Everything feels like um, it's something's going to happen or something negative is going to happen. And that's a survival mechanism. Um, and so when that happens, though, um, then we actually react in our environments very differently. So if I always think that I'm in harm's way, I'm going to respond differently in my environment, socially, emotionally, and cognitively. Hopefully that makes sense, kind of puts together the last few slides that we've talked about. One of the things we also know is that it doesn't just affect our brain development. Um, the brain is the central processing of our bodies and the memory of our experience actually gets stored in our bodies. So I love this uh, slide because it actually shows that um, this trauma or the negative effects of this stress actually affect things like our arteries and our immunity and our hormones and our muscle proteins. So while it starts in our brain and in the brain development and in the way our genes are expressed, because it's the central processing for our bodies, it affects the, all of the systems within our bodies, which also helps explain why these negative health outcomes are more likely. What I'd like to do now is just briefly share a quick video. Um, it's one of my favorites, um, and it actually helps explain a little bit about epigenetics, which is the science of the way our genes are expressed. And if you recall on the ACE pyramid, I talked about how our brains develop differently and how our genes get expressed differently. And this video does an excellent job of explaining that. So I thought I would share it with you. The sweet smell of fruit doesn't normally send rats running, but when researchers paired the orange cherry almondy scent of the chemical acetophenone with a painful electric shock, lab rats quickly learned to fear it. Along the way, extra neurons sprouted in their noses and in the smell processing center of their brains, making them super sensitive to the scent. This result isn't shocking. What is surprising is that the rat's pups and their pups' pups were also startled by the smell of acetophenone and had the same extra neurons as their fathers, despite never having been introduced to either their dad's or the fruity scent before. But how could the pups have inherited something that their fathers learned? Basic genetics tells us that only DNA gets passed along to offspring. Characteristics like memories, scars, or giant muscles can't get passed on since acquiring them doesn't alter the genetic code. But it turns out that instilling fear in the rats did trigger genetic changes, not in the DNA sequence itself, but instead in how that code was read and used in the rats' bodies. In every cell, biological machinery constantly translates DNA into the proteins needed to carry out vital processes. Chemical switches attached to the DNA turn genes on or off or up and down, telling the machinery which proteins to produce and in what quantities. These switches, called epigenetic tags, are why a kidney cell looks and acts differently than a skin or nerve cell, even though all three cells have identical DNA. But the switches in any one cell aren't set in stone. Teaching those rats to fear the fruity smell switched one of their smell sensing genes into overdrive. Researchers don't know all the places in the rat's bodies where this switch got flipped, but they know it happened in one key set of cells, the rat's sperm cells, which would one day pass along the tweaked genetic material, making the next generation of rats super sensitive to acetophenone. Rodents aren't the only creatures demonstrating this weird type of inheritance. In Ivacolic, Sweden, boys who suffered through tough winter famines went on to have super healthy sons with extremely low rates of heart disease and diabetes. And their son sons had the same excellent health, living an unbelievable 32 years longer on average than the grandsons of boys who hadn't gone hungry. To be clear, this does not mean that we should start starving our kids for the benefit of future generations. Scientists don't even know yet exactly which switches the Swedish famines flipped. While we have been able to connect specific epigenetic changes to health effects in mice, we're a long way off from being able to make those connections in humans. That may sound like a bummer, but it's mostly because we humans don't live in the well-controlled environment of a laboratory. And for that, we should be grateful.
The sweet well, smell of fruit. How cool is that? I just think that that is really cool. So I don't want to dive into epigenetics, but I like to share that. Um, I actually heard that story. I didn't see the video first. I heard the story. I was really intrigued by it. Um, and I just share that with you as something that you might be intrigued by as well. And kind of helps further explain that it's not just brain development and the way our brains develop, but also um, in some ways, that's the heritability or how trauma can be inherited that is sort of in our bodies that we may not have much control over. So I like to just help folks understand that some of it may be things that we didn't even necessarily experience. So what I'd like to do now is sort of shift our focus to thinking about, so I started with sort of the what, so what are ACEs, what's the research, what's the data, then I kind of moved into the so what, so why should we care, right? What does this mean? And that's when I began talking about brain development and why, why it's important to understand. And now I'd like to move us into sort of what I call the now what. So now that I know all this, it's a lot, right? We've, we've covered a lot in the last 45 minutes or so. What, what does that mean and, and what can I do about it? Well, this is where to me the message of hope comes in. And one of the things that research has found is that ACEs are not destiny. And a child who's experienced adversity in their life can be resilient and, and literally bounce back. And creating a positive community ensures that they will. And so to me, this is where we fit in, right? This is where I fit in, where you fit in. This is how we can make a difference. And one of the ways I look, like to share and I would look to is the Center on the Developing Child. They've been actually leading this effort. And what they have found and through research and science is that it's never too late to help adults build up what's known as their core capabilities. And when we do that, they can have a lifelong impact, especially if they're developed over a lifetime. So when adults have the ability to build core skills that are need, needed to be productive, so things like um, creating you know, understanding about um, deadlines and understanding how to plan and understanding how to actually function in this world, right? When we're able to build these core skills, then they're more likely to become, um, contribute to an economy that's stronger and a generation of um, citizens and students and parents who will thrive. And so the Center on the Developing Child actually has an entire framework, which will be shared with you in the digital folder, that looks at these three principles. So first and foremost, reducing the sources of stress, which of course we all have the opportunity to do with children and adults, helping strengthen those core life skills, and then supporting these responsive relationships. There's an, a whole nother presentation I could do on the data around this. And what it's found is that when these things are in place, the, the negative health outcomes are less. So a person who has an ACE score, let's say of four, is always gonna have an ACE score of four. But when these principles are in place, so whether I'm a young adult or an adult and I am able to have my brain be less stressed and I'm able to practice strengthening core life skills and I'm supported with responsive relationships, then the likelihood of developing these negative health outcomes goes down. So while the ACE score may remain the same, uh, the negative outcomes is less and that's the part that's really exciting. And then of course, thinking about that intergenerational cycle, as a parent, when I know better, I do better. So as I begin to understand what I experienced and then can maybe change what my child experiences, then we can break that cycle. So that ACE prevalence, which hasn't moved since the original study, right? Two thirds of adults have at least one ACE. Maybe when my kids have kids, so in 10 to 20 years, that ACE prevalence will start to come down because we can break that cycle. I just want to show one more quick video that um, comes from the Center on the Developing Child. And again, it does a really nice job of kind of putting these pieces together. After this, then I'm going to just briefly share some um, actionable next steps and then we'll close out the session.
social challenges that face modern societies, whether it's the ability to work productively, to be a good citizen, stay healthy, have their roots in early health and development. A strong foundation in early childhood results in much better and more effective development later. A weak foundation really puts us behind. The most important thing children need to thrive is to live in an environment of relationships that begins in their family, but also extends out to include adults who are family members in your child care centers and other programs. What children need is for that entire environment of relationships to be invested in their healthy development. We've shown from decades of testing interventions that we can improve outcomes. But the magnitude of those impacts is not good enough. Science is now available to help us think about what we might do that would have a bigger impact than the best of what we've done before. So we began to ask, what could we be doing differently? What could we do to be smarter? Children who are at the greatest risk for the poorest outcomes in learning and health and behavior are children who experience a pileup, a cumulative burden of one after another after another of risk factors. And then the burden is more than any child could be expected to overcome. So we began to focus on the development of the adults. What could we be doing to strengthen the capacity of everyone who interacts with children? This led us to think about the kinds of skills you need to deal with adversity. These skills of focusing attention, planning, monitoring, delaying gratification, being able to solve problems, being able to work in teams, executive function and self-regulation. They're also the kind of skills you need to create a well-regulated home and school environment in which healthy development and learning can take place. And then brain science started to tell us that differences in those skills start to develop in infancy based on the environment kids live in. So how do those skills get built? Well, if you don't develop them early, how do you develop them later? Actually, you can build them later because the period of flexibility and plasticity for this part of the brain doesn't fully mature until age 25 to 30. So then the light bulb went on. The reason we're not getting a bigger impact is not because we don't know about how to influence development, but because we're giving information and advice to people who we need to do active skill building with. Skill building by coaching, by training, by practice. But we're not doing that. So we now have developed this theory of change that says we need to focus on the development of the adults who are important in kids' lives. We need to focus on their skills, their needs, in order for them to be better, more effective parents, in order for them to be better prepared to be employable, which would enhance the economic stability of the family, which is also good for children. Second of all, we looked at many people in preschool programs and child care centers. And we said, what are we doing to build those skills in the providers? They need skill building as well. And also the community can help to build and reinforce the capacities that parents need. And the community also includes programs in which the people who work in the programs have sufficient skills. Third of all, what are the major sources of toxic stress in this community and how can we reduce them? Moving it up to a policy level, how are our policies strengthening communities' abilities to reduce source of toxic stress and caregivers' abilities to provide what kids need? The development of our human capital is our future. The development of a productive workforce is our future. The development of a healthy population is our future. This kind of future orientation is critical for healthy society. It's critical for a thriving business. It's critical for successful environmental relationships to raise children. It's all about being able to plan for the future, to have a future. And that's why this is so important. So I hope that that was really helpful um, as we kind of consider
why this matters, right? So what can we do about it? Why does this matter? And where can I fit into the solution? So what I wanna leave us with now is hopefully you're feeling somewhat empowered, maybe even a little excited now that you've begun to understand this a little bit more. We've created this common meaning and shared meaning and common understanding about ACEs. So now what can you do, right? It feels really overwhelming and really big. So now what can we do? So what I like to do, what I'd like to do is leave you with a few um, suggestions. The first step on any journey in my mind is like any journey, you need to take that first step. And so I think one of the first things we can do is begin to shift our questions when talking to adults, when talking to children, when talking to one another. And instead of either thinking or saying, what's wrong with you? Instead, consider asking, I wonder what's going on? What's happened to you? And, and how might I be able to help you? Um, and eventually maybe even helping folks understand that they could use their story to help make things better for them. So, that first step would be one thing that I would suggest is that we begin to kind of shift our questions. Then I also have some other suggestions um, when I think about what might folks do after hearing all of this. I think there's great power in sharing this information and resources with others. And I say that every time I have the opportunity. Um, just sharing this information is powerful. I think what we need to be able to do is shift the narrative in our communities and in our society that this, these things are real and these things have real lasting effects. And once we understand about it more, we can um, do better. Once we know better, we can do better. So I think it's really important um, to just share this information. One of the ways you can do that is by attending or offering um, screening of several films. Uh, so in the center is uh, the film Resilience, which is currently available by DVD. And I think you can get streaming rights. Uh, and it's an hour long and it does a great job of explaining um, the story of ACEs and how to overcome or work with folks to build resilience. The Michigan ACE Initiative has also developed two uh, shorter videos. One of the things that um, was found is that, you know, when sharing this information, you don't always have an hour to show a video and have a discussion. So the two videos that are have bitlies here are about 15 or 20 minutes. The first one talks about ACEs in Michigan, and the second one called Building Resilience talks about sort of strategies that are happening here in Michigan. The third suggestion I have, and this is where I often tell people to start. So when I started my job and my folks were asking me what I did, I had them watch this TED Talk. So Nadine Burke Harris is a pediatrician from Southern California who started the Center for Youth Wellness and is now actually the Surgeon General in California. And back in the uh, 2014, she did this amazing 20 minute TED Talk where she talks about uh, childhood trauma and how that um, has lasting effects. And I think that's a great place for people to start. There's also a film that is done by the same company that did Resilience known as Paper Tigers. This is actually available streaming, I think on Netflix and Amazon Prime. And it chronicles a year in the life of Lincoln High School, which is in the community of Walla Walla, Washington. And the reason I share it with all of you is because your um, educators are working in education. So it's really well done, really interesting to watch. And I highly recommend um, watching Paper Tigers as well. In the digital library, there will also be these um, tools, which I call user-friendly information tools or UFITs. So there are three here. One of them on the left was created by the Washtenaw Trauma-Informed Collaborative. And it's a front and back, this is showing you the front, um, that talks about the impact of stress on brain growth and development. And then on the reverse side talks about um, building resilience and the kinds of things to um, buffer those um, negative effects. So that's a wonderful one pager that um, is made available to you as a Word document and a PDF. On the back side, there's room for people to put their local information. So if you wanted to distribute that in community settings or faith settings or educational settings, it's a great tool. Then of course, um, on the right is the infographic for the Center on the Developing Child. I showed you the top half of that early in the presentation. And in the lower right um, is something from Futures Without Violence. And it's actually a little card that is the size of a business card and it folds out. It's called Connected Parents, Connected Kids. And it's a really nice way, it does a nice way of explaining um, 
the effects of trauma and ways to overcome that um, by building resilience. So these are available for free. Uh, you just have to pay for shipping. And so I'll provide the information about those as well. Again, these are just a variety of strategies to kind of go with that first um, idea that I gave you, which is to share information and resources. I also think it's really powerful to connect with one another. So I appreciate the opportunity to be here today and to connect with all of you. Um, as I mentioned early in the presentation, I'm actually a master trainer with the Michigan ACE Initiative, which is uh, separate from state government. It's a community-based um, um, initiative that lives within a foundation. And there are about 137 master trainers around the state. And that's what this little pin map is showing you. And as a master trainer, uh, we all can do what I'm doing today, which is share information with groups of people. So one of the things I'm going to share with you is a list of master trainers because you may have one available in your community. And so another thing you could do is reach out to a person in your community who's affiliated with the ACE initiative and they could help share this message. Of course, I consider myself uh, an, a lifelong adult learner. And so these are two excellent books that I would highly recommend. On the left is The Body Keeps the Score, which to me was one of the first things I read when I began doing this work. It's really well done. And then on the right, um, Nadine Burke Harris, the person who did the TED Talk, recently released a book called The Deepest Well, where, um, and it's a very easy read, where she talks about um, her experience in um, dealing with childhood adversity and how to um, help overcome that. So to close, I guess I just want to again thank you all for you know being here today and being interested in understanding about ACEs. And my guess, aside from those four take-home messages that I shared throughout the presentation, I think ultimately I just want us all to remember that it's a journey and we all are in different excuse me, we're all in different spots on this journey. And so just giving ourselves grace and space to learn and grow. Um, and so acknowledging that maybe you be, may be a little further along than a colleague or a family that you're working with or an administrator. And so just being aware of this journey. And when I share, when you look at this model in the digital library, there's actually lots of great corresponding um, materials that can provide strategies on how to move through these phases. So I would encourage you to um, spend some time looking at that. To close, I just want to share this graphic, which comes from Washington State. Uh, so this is not Michigan, it's in Washington State, but this is looking at a pie chart that um, in this case is looking at, you know, chronic diseases, negative health outcomes. And each of those pieces of the pie represents one. And one of the things I think about when I think about understanding about ACEs and addressing ACEs is truly the powerful effect that we can have when we all do this together. So the black blob or the, it might look like an oil slick in the center of this pie chart actually represents the percent of that negative health outcome that is attributed to ACEs. So when looking, let's say, at cardiovascular disease, over 25.5% of cardiovascular disease is attributed to early adversity, 24% of cancer, 67% of life, life dissatisfaction, almost 59% of HIV or high-risk uh, HIV. So what this says and what this helps demonstrate is that ACEs are a huge determinant of many of these outcomes. However, when we work together collectively, I always tell folks we can be like the sponge in the center of this oil slick. So when my kids have kids, the ACEs attributable effects will be far less because we are collectively working together. Of course, there'll continue to be cancer research and all kinds of other interventions in each of these areas. But when we collectively can address ACEs, then we can actually improve the outcomes for people in all of these areas at once. So I hope that that leaves you with a sense of hope and excitement and some desire to collectively work together. Again, I want to thank you for um, allowing me to be a part of the um, conference this year. I think the magnitude of the solution, the previous slide really does demonstrate that when we strengthen our reach together, we have more powerful impacts. Here's the references, which will be made available in the digital library, and of course, my contact information. I'd be happy to talk with anyone further. Uh, I'm happy to continue any conversations, clear up any questions that folks have, or even help connect you to some resources within your community to continue the message.
So thank you again for the opportunity and hope that you found something helpful and interesting and look forward to um, great things happening.